Okay. I've already been told I need to crack the whip, so thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Di Robinson and I am with the SES Community Engagement Unit. I would like to open this meeting with an acknowledgement of country. Um, the SES acknowledges traditional owners of the country throughout Australia and recognise the continuing connection to land, waters and communities. We acknowledge the first people of the River Murray and the Mallee region as the custodians of this region. And we also acknowledge their cultural and heritage beliefs. And we understand they are still as important today to the living River Murray and Mallee people. We also pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Now, just some very brief housekeeping. There is an exit door here. The toilets are down the back and there's another door out to the side um, in the event that we all have to run in a hurry. But that won't happen. So tonight is um, an information session and we have a range of guest speakers tonight that will be providing information for us and we will have a question um, session at the end of it. We have speakers from the SES, um, the Department of Environment and Water. We have the CEO and the Director of Infrastructure from the Mid Murray Council and the Department of Industries and Transport, Primary Industry and Regions of SA. Um, unfortunately, Power Australia, uh, SA Power, um, South Australian Power Networks weren't able to spend a speaker tonight um, despite their very best efforts and, but they have given me some speaking notes so I'll provide an update from them and we also have um, SA Water. So let's get on with it. What we're going to do or how the format will run is that we will have all our speakers um, present first and then we will open the, the floor up for questions. Um, so I do ask that you hold any questions until the end. Look, we do want to get all through your questions, but in reality, and thank you everybody so much for coming out and wanting to work with the agencies. We really, really appreciate that. But we do hope that you have a lot of questions. While we won't be able to answer them all, we do have some um, pages over here and some sticky notes. So I'd like you to think about questions that you would like to raise and that you would like the different agencies to answer. There's pens over there as well and little yellow sticky notes. If you have anything, put it down and put it against the agency that it refers to and I will make sure that it gets to those agencies. And they have been providing um, responses to those through their website fact, fact sheets and also through their social media. Um, and it is very important for you to, to put those questions down. We would really encourage that. While they're trying to provide responses to questions, you people in the room tonight know what's important for you and you know the questions that you do really want answers to. So please, at any time, grab a sticky note and write it down. Even as we're going through the speakers, if something comes up in your mind, please jot it down. Um, we also now have a... Oh, there will be a lot of information and we do hope you go away with some more information um, than, you, than you have arrived with, although I, I'm sure a lot of you are keeping up to date with this event anyway. Um, so we're going to have a few minutes of I guess to, we do have a lot of brochures and the agencies have provided brochures, so please take some on your way out and take some for people that haven't been able to attend tonight and please feel free to discuss this, uh, whatever you learn tonight, the information with any community members or, will, or your friends, community members and um, so forth. I also wanted to let you know that tonight is being live streamed for those that weren't able to come tonight. Um, thank you Samuel for setting all that up. And um, so I do ask the speakers to speak clearly into the mic um, so that we can actually capture all the information. Now, I think that's about all I wanted to say to start off at the moment. So we will start off. I'd like to welcome Steph Zawaski. Oh, Steph um, from the SES. And she's the SES Incident Controller. Thanks, Steph. Thanks, 
So, um, I'm, my name is Steph. Um, I am currently one of the deputy incident controllers for this incident. I just want to really start by saying thank you. This is an amazing turnout. I really appreciate that you've all up the time to come and find out the situation and get as much information as you can to help prepare yourselves and your fellow community members. So, I really appreciate that you've taken the time to do this um, and to, to hear what these guys have got to say. Um, I'm going to touch on a few things, particularly from an SES point of view. Um, and well, I'll probably in the process of that touch on a few extra pieces. Um, some of these other speakers will then expand on those, so as I said, questions um, at the end. I'm hoping that by the time we get to the end, a lot of your questions may have been answered. Um, but we'll work through that and, and answer anything extra that we need to at the end. So as I said, my name is Stephanie. I'm currently a Deputy Incident Controller with this incident. Um, we have been monitoring the flow rates into South Australia for um, a number of weeks now, months really, um, as we've been watching those um, forecast rates increase. Um, we know that at the moment the current flow rate over the border is about 91 gigalitres a day, and we know that that's going to expect it to increase to 100 um, by the 12th of November. Um, I think one of the things that we, we've all heard recently is that those figures continue to jump. So at the moment we do know that we're expected to hit a peak of over 150 by early December. Um, I'm going to let Kimberly expand more from Department of Environment and Water on those forecast um, changes. Uh, the one thing I'd want to flag, and I'm sure all of you are very much aware of this, is the highest flow rate we've seen since the 70s. It may even end up being higher than what we saw in the 70s. So this is um, our, we're doing our very best to be able to keep you guys as much in the loop as we can um, so that we can prepare ourselves because this is going to be beyond what a lot of people in this room have seen before. The SES has established an incident management team. We're based in Loxton. We're working seven days a week um, to be able to work across all of the different agencies to understand the impacts. We're working very hard to have a look at the data that's provided to us by the Department of Environment and Water, by the other agencies, including Department for Environment and Transport, uh, sorry, Infrastructure and Transport, um, and a number of other supporting agencies. Councils have been amazing at providing us with support and information. Um, to understand that what those flow rates look like for you and what those impacts look like on the ground. I think it's fair to say that whatever we saw in the 70s, the River Channel has changed and the impacts will look different this time around anyway. So we're trying to work hard to understand the risks and then once we understand those risks, then we can actually put together some action plans about how we're going to support you, but also how you can support yourself. So part of this talk today will be about some of the actions that you can take as well to prepare your property. We talked about the other stakeholders that we've been meeting with. We meet regularly with what's called a zone emergency support team. That's made up of a range of different agencies, um, a number of whom you see across the front here and you'll hear from today. But we also have in the room SAPOL, who are the coordinating agency. Um, I saw SAS somewhere in the back of the room as well. Um, and we also have MFS uh, that join us as well. So we, all the agencies across government and non-government representation um, occurs in those ZEST meetings, it's a zone emergency support team meetings, um, so that we can all work together to best support you. I want to, I think it's really important to acknowledge that as a community, this isn't a new, this is not suddenly a new event for you guys. You've been seeing impacts and those water levels rise in the shack areas, so between Cadell and Manham for a a number of weeks now and we really do recognise that. We know that you've had some roads cut, we know that there are a number of properties that have started to see inundation. This isn't new for you. Um, what is new now is the changing forecast levels. So back in 2016 a number of the communities in this shack area saw some property inundation. Um, that property inundation is now going to be exceeded so that's why these community meetings are really important. One of the things that we're hoping to work through um, in, as a part of the community process, uh, communication process is these community meetings. We're also trying to hold street corner meetings for the individual shack areas. We, I need to acknowledge we're not going to get to everybody. Some of those shack areas have already been isolated and cut off. I apologise for that. Um, but we are going to try and work through street corner meetings for um, vulnerable communities as we work our way down the river. I said DW is going to provide a forecast situation update for you shortly, but we do know that the, that forecast was changed today um, and it has increased. There is now a high likelihood of it reaching 160 
gigalitres over the border, um, a moderate chance of 200 and a, a low probability of, of greater than that. Um, what we understand is that there are about 45 townships uh, south of Cadell that are already experiencing and will continue to experience the um, impacts of those increased flows. Council have been working really closely with us to be able to understand the impacts to roads, um, your community waste management systems, um, isolated communities or residents that have chosen to stay, all of those sorts of things. So we're working hand in hand with Council and I have to say they've been um, beyond supportive to the SES response to this so far, it's been amazing. I think um, it's fair to say that the community impacts in the shack areas downstream of Cadell are significant. I don't think um, any of us would be hiding the fact that there we're talking hundreds, if not greater properties impacted in some way, shape or form, probably probably much greater than hundreds, to be honest. Um, so I think we, we know at the moment at about 100 gig, there's probably about 1,000 properties that are likely to be impacted. Um, as that increases, um, the phone rate increases, that will increase as well. And so that's why we're trying to work through with you about how we can help you prepare your properties and, you, and yourselves um, for this event. At the moment we have a Watch and Act out for both um, portions of the River Murray. We have split the River Murray into two sections for warning purposes. Um, at the upper River Murray and the lower area. Um, prior to that, you would have all been exposed to a, uh, a flood advice that was just for the shack areas. Once the river entered 100 flows of a forecast 100 gigalitres a day, it actually puts the entire river into what we call um, a minor flood. And so we have to change our warning messaging. So at the moment we have a watch and act for the upper parts of the river and for the lower parts of the river, and that will remain in place until the forecast says we need to change it. You're going to hear an awful lot of information tonight um, about where you can find um, like different contact numbers, different websites, all of those kinds of things. Um, and those are all really, really important. And luckily all of these agencies have got flyers that have those details on them for you. But one of the easiest things for you to remember is the sa.gov.au website. That is where we've tried to collate um, all of those websites and social media pages into one um, centralised web page so that you don't have to remember 20 different places. So it's sa.gov.au and the idea is that we're trying to provide a coordinated communications effort for you. If you have any questions afterwards, by all means you can speak to us about that if you have trouble finding it. We also have an SES floodline um, and I'll give you the number now but please note that it is on our flyers that you'll find over on the table. It's 1800 362 361 that number is 1800 362 361 and that's an information line that's manned uh, Monday to Friday 9 to 5 and they can provide you with some extra information. The other place you can go is the social media pages. It's very dynamic. Um, SES is trying hard to keep that up to, as up to date as possible and I know a number of the other agencies are also trying to do the same. I'm going to talk about sandbagging because sandbagging is a little bit like toilet paper during COVID. It's a bit of a touchy subject. Um, but sandbagging is something that I know a number of you probably have already been doing um, and have been getting sandbags from. I know we've had a couple of community sandbag days here in Blanchetown already. Uh, we are trying to make sure that we've got enough resources for everybody, um, but I think it's important to note that there is sandbagging and then there is very effective sandbagging. Um, and one of the best ways that you can find out how to protect your property best is to actually have a chat with some of the SES volunteers or with Pray myself afterwards. Um, sandbagging your property may not mean building yourself a sandbagging wall. In actual fact, that may just be um, an awful lot of waste of your time um, and resources trying to build it when we talk about these increased flows now. However, you can sandbag your doorways your vents and your drains in an attempt to try and stop that water from ingressing into your property. We will be holding, uh, sorry, we, we are now um, putting together, we have done community sandbagging days. What we're doing now are putting together some um, strategic locations for staffed 
sandbagging um, locations and they're going to be in effect from, I believe it's from Saturday, um, and their hours of operation are going to be between um, 7 o'clock in the morning until 1 o'clock in the afternoon, um, and they will have sandbags on site, sands, there'll be people there who can answer your questions, um, and the closest one for you is actually here, right there. In fact, there might even be sands there already. It's my sandbags, but there's sands there already. Um, I believe we're also doing one at the Morgan Oval for those of you that have come from up that way as well. Um, on top of the IMT, so the Incident Management Team actions um, that we're working on in Loxton, we also are supported by our State Control Centre, so there's a centralised um, area point in SES where um, a lot of this is being coordinated across, and we are reporting into the State Emergency Centre as well, and again, that's where we're putting that cross-government coordination in place to make sure that we're all working together to get the best outcomes. So what can you do? And I think this is really important because, as I mentioned before, the number of properties impacted is going to be huge. And I'd love to be able to tell you that I could put an SES truck on every street, but the reality is that's not going to be possible or necessarily effective. But there are a number of things that you can do as a property owner to try and protect your property. So I think you can, to start with, it's doing things like this, becoming aware of what your risk is, attending community meetings like this, having a look at some of the websites where there's the flood extent modelling that DEW have. Um, we're going to have maps here tonight, so afterwards you can have a look and we can help you try and find your property and talk you through what some of those risks might be for you. Um, it's about that sandbagging of doors and vents and drains, as I mentioned before. Uh, it's lifting objects off of the ground, so trying to lift everything up as much as possible or remove it if you can and if you have somewhere safe to store it, otherwise um, just lifting it up. If you're a river user, and I would hazard a guess that most of you are, um, we, we're asking people to be very mindful that these flows, even now, at only 91 gear a day, are incredibly fast and they're going to remain fast, and they're going to remain fast and high for a really long time. So if you are a river user, we'd ask that you work within your skill set, um, and that you're mindful of the properties alongside the river. So if you're feeling unsafe launching your vessel, or you're feeling unsafe operating a vessel on the river, please don't. Um, if you are confident enough to get on the water, please make sure that you're wearing the appropriate um, safety devices. Excuse me. Um, and that you're mindful of the wake that your vessel may be causing into properties that are also inundated. The other thing that I think you're probably all going to be aware of is that as the water rises, there are a number of um, submerged objects that are now going to create navigational hazards for you on the river. So there is the fixed objects that um, are being buoyed where possible so that you know where they are, but there's also the submerged objects and debris that's floating downstream. Um, please be mindful when operating a vessel that you may find that there is an increased amount of debris and submerged objects floating down the river. Please be aware of the road closures and any water over the roads. Um, sometimes it can be quite deceptive and you might find the council have put a road closure sign up and they've put it up quite a distance away from where the water actually is. Please don't ignore it. It's up there for a reason um, and it's to stop both yourselves and your vehicle um, being uh, submerged in the water but also to try and prevent some of the additional damage that could be caused to the roads themselves um, by driving on them when they're wet or muddy. You can make a decision if you're a permanent resident. Um, I think it's really important at this point that we talk about whether you're going to make the decision to stay or go. Um, there are some really great flyers that SES have that can help you make that decision, but some of the key considerations you would need to make are about your own medical health, um, and your ability to get out to medical aid. Um, the other thing is whether you have um, financial considerations that mean if you're isolated for a long period of time, perhaps there's an impact on those. Social considerations, and being isolated is a really hard thing. I think we're all very well aware of that after COVID and needing to isolate for very long periods of time. Um, the other thing to consider too is whether you have the ability to get out and resupply yourself um, so do you have a tinny that means you can get to a vehicle somewhere and do your shopping? Pretty sure Woolies doesn't deliver out here um, or on the water, unfortunately. Maybe that can be a new business model. 
but we, I think it's one of those things that you just need to consider because um, the other thing is if you choose to stay, you may very well have lost your power and you may very well have lost um, access to your effluent system, so your sewerage system. And those are some key hygiene considerations that you need to take into account. Even when you come back to your property, if the power has been turned off and you've had stuff in your freezer, obviously you're going to end up with a lot of rancid food and those sorts of things. So those considerations are really important if you're choosing to stay. If you choose to stay, make sure you're telling somebody. So a family member, friends, the SES. Um, if you change your plan and you choose to go, then please tell those same people. Um, because if you don't tell them and you leave, there'll be an assumption made that perhaps you are still there and unnecessary resources may be looking for you or spend time looking for you. Emergency relief is here tonight. We are, then I'm going to let Tina talk um, about what um, is happening with emergency relief um, because they are supporting the incident management team for people that do end up phrase is displaced, it's not a particularly nice term, I'm sorry, um, but it, for those that do need to leave but have nowhere to go, Tina is um, going to be able to touch on that today. So again, how can we keep ourselves personally safe? Keep up to date with the safety warnings, monitor the road closures, um, councils have been great about updating road closures and I know that they've been communicating to you on a regular basis, um, don't drive through floodwaters. Don't undertake river use unless it's within your capabilities. Um, be aware of any downed power lines. Please don't let children play in or near floodwaters. Um, be mindful of any waterborne or insect vector diseases. So we know we've got JEV, Rossova virus, um, and Murray River encephalitis. So just being mindful of those risks and making sure you're looking after yourself. Consider the suitability of your drinking water. And I'm going to finish on one final thing. At the end of the day, the SES is working really hard to make sure that we're doing the best thing that we can for you and your properties um, and yourselves personally. Um, but if you need us um, at any point, you can call for a flood response. You can call 13 um, 25 00, so 132 500 and we will be able to still provide that flood response for you. So please don't hesitate to make sure that you contact the SES when you need to. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you, Steph. And I also just wanted to note that the SES is the lead agency for flood and that's why we're actually facilitating this meeting tonight. And I also just wanted to reiterate what Steph was saying um, regarding the SAGov au website. Um, I was on there again today and it does have all those links so you will hear a lot of contact numbers um, and email, uh, sorry, website addresses tonight. You can go to that sa.gov.au and they will be there, links are there. Um, next I would like to invite Kimberly Williamson from the Department of Environment and Water and you will hear that probably referred to as due throughout the night. Thanks Kimberly. Thanks Di. Um, can everyone hear me? I'm terrible at using my is that better? Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, so my name is Kimberly Williamson. I am a Senior Operations Officer with the Department for Environment and Water and I'm here to talk to you about the forecast um, flow coming to SA and also water levels. Um, so as you all may have heard this afternoon, the flow advice has been updated and we're now estimating that the peak to South Australia will be at least 165 gigalitres per day. So for perspective, today is at 91 gigalitres per day, so it's obviously quite a big increase. Um, we're also estimating there's a moderate possibility it could get to 200 gigalitres per day and a lesser possibility of 220 gigalitres per day. So quite high levels. Um, yeah, obviously 220 is higher than 1974, so yeah. The reason why um, we provide a range of water levels, so 165 to 220, is because it's quite hard to know exactly what is coming to the state until it's past places like Wentworth, um, upstream, and even when it 
comes out of the Wakul River uh, further up um, in New South Wales. So once those places peak, we get a much better understanding of what's exactly coming to South Australia. So those places haven't peaked at this current time, which is why we're giving a range. Um, keep in mind that catchment conditions upstream are very wet. Um, all the major dams are full and spilling. Uh, so any additional rainfall in Victoria and New South Wales has the potential to add to the flow to South Australia. Uh, the best way to stay up to date with the flow forecast is um, by a publication we put out every Friday morning uh, called the Flow Report. Um, you can search for the sign up page on the DW website, just go to the sa.gov.au website and you can sign up for that or come and see me afterwards and I can add you to the list. Included in that flow report, we provide estimated water levels for projected flows. So um, for this coming week, it's like we, we will have the estimated water levels at places, at all the locks, at major towns. If the flow were to get to 180, if it were to get to 200 gigalitres per day. So it's just to give you a guide of what the water levels could reach. Keep in mind though that every flood event is different. They all move differently. Um, and there's a lot of assumptions that go into those estimations. So please just use them as a guide. It's not the definite what's going to happen. Uh, we also provide a range of inundation maps, so maps that show where we've, we think water will go to under certain flows. So you'll find uh, mapping here that shows that 160 gigalitres per day where we think the river will spread to. Um, things to note with these maps is that they are generated by modelling, so they're not actual events. Um, they do make a lot of assumptions, like the water levels, so they assume that levees are in good working condition as the day they were built. Um, in reality, some may have been taken away, they may be damaged, um, vegetation cover, and all these types of things can alter the water levels and where it goes. Um, so again, just keep that in mind when you're viewing the maps. Um, the last thing I just wanted to mention is that while there's currently no black water in South Australia and that's where the dissolved oxygen levels fall within the river and you often get fish kills and very black and smelly water. Um, we don't have any of that here in South Australia at the moment but it is upstream in New South Wales and Victoria so just keep in mind that it is likely over the coming weeks that we could see black water um, come into our areas. Thanks, Kimberly. And actually, um, as Kimberly noted, we've got the maps over there so you can view them at the end of the session. Um, I'd like to invite Ben Scales, who's the CEO of the Mid Murray Council. Thank you. Thank you very much, and again, thank you for all coming along um, tonight. Uh, so, Council's been working with um, the SES, with the lead agency, since uh, September uh, on this event. Um, we've instigated our critical incident management team um, structure as well as our business continuity management uh, team as well. Um, they've both been activated to manage the event in, um, with, with the lead agencies and the other agencies that are here tonight. Um, we have also acted, although we're focusing on preparedness, uh, we've also activated our risk um, management plan and appointed a recovery manager, sorry, a recovery um, management plan and appointed a recovery manager. We need to start thinking about that. Um, as you've heard from the other speakers, this is going to be a long event, um, but we need to understand what we're going to do in um, recovery as well. Uh, as um, was mentioned by um, Kimberly, the forecast has changed today. So we had mapped up to 200 gigalitres per day on, uh, throughout our area on all of our assets. Um, now we are increasing that to 250 gigalitres per day. We hopefully uh, don't have to deal with that, but it's obviously important that we uh, are prepared. Um, our priority thus far has been asset risk assessment um, and flood mitigation strategies to protect and preserve people and assets. This is including our swim systems or STED systems, so community waste management systems, um, roads, um, we've got over 3,000 kilometres, and I do acknowledge a 
colleagues from Oxford Way 3 here tonight too, who have areas across the river. Um, so of that 3,000 kilometres of road network, we're expecting uh, 250 roads to be impacted um, in excess of 300 kilometres. Now that obviously may change with the increased flooding, uh, sorry, increased, increased projections as well. We'll be doing asset assessments on our levee banks, our marine structures, which has included removing uh, pontoons and closing boat ramps, and looking at our priority assets up and down the river. From a community perspective, we've been working with the SES on sandbagging, and as we said, there's been some issues with sandbag um, uh, supply. Um, but you know, uh, as was mentioned, um, we don't necessarily need to be building massive structures. It's about prioritising, and there's um, some information sheets on what you can do with uh, sandbagging. We ran seven community sandbagging sites with the SES over the weekend. Um, and now we are prioritising them to four up and down the river in strategic uh, placements or places um, and they'll both have sand and um, also sandbags um, working with the SES. Um, we've delivered over 1,500 tonne of sand thus far and I think 2,000 was by the end of this week and obviously that will increase um, as we continue to move forward. Um, we've, we are understanding and working with other agencies on displaced um, residents and we've communicated out a number of sites. Some have facilities, some don't. Um, obviously the caravan parks are going to be impacted because they're generally along the river. Um, but if you are looking and you've got caravan and camping um, facilities, then we've promoted them out. Um, and the other agencies, I mean, housing here, uh, will talk about um, evacuation centres um, that may come in uh, to play moving forward. Um, we've also established the Morgan Sporting Complex as a, a free site for camping. Um, and we're just in the process of finalising one in Madam and in Blanche Town as well, and we're having conversations and hopefully we'll be able to communicate that out um, tomorrow or early next week. We've also been working with the other agencies to support vulnerable people. Um, from a development perspective, um, there's no mechanism in the Act for works um, without a development approval. Um, however, we've developed a process for emergency building works, um, such as construction of uh, flood banks or um, mooring poles. We understand that obviously mooring poles are at a set level and there may be need for houseboat um, operators or um, people with houseboats to look at their mooring poles. Um, so we've developed a process um, where we've enabled emergency works under the section 135 of the Planning, Development and Infrastructure Act, um, which allows us for work to be taken when there's a risk to uh, property or people. Um, we're also working with our colleagues um, to seek amendments to the regulations to enable uh, emergency works um, to be undertaken. So we've developed a process, uh, and this will be on our website, is you still need to notify council of any works you're going to do, but you don't need to submit a DA as part of the normal process and have that approved prior to doing those works. We understand that's just not practical. Um, but you still do need to do, at this point in time, to submit a DA at some point. Um, encourage you to speak with council or the other councils and speak to their planners. If you've got any questions, they can give you advice. We understand that time is of the essence and we want to facilitate that as best we can. Um, we also ask though, when you are doing emergency works, that you do give consideration um, to how the construction will impact neighbours or other properties um, you know, adjacent to you. Um, and I do want to stress this is just about emergency works to do with flood and inundation, not just because you, you know, maybe want to build a new shed um, somewhere. So it's, we try to make it a streamlined process as best as we can. Uh, from a financial support, we obviously appreciate this going to have a significant event on business operators uh, and also residents. Um, you might be aware we well, well, it's closed now. Our voting is closed on the uh, local government elections at 5 p.m. today. Um, a new council will be elected on Saturday, um, and we will be having a first meeting on November 22, uh, and we'll be workshopping opportunities for providing financial support and relief. Um, to those that have been impacted by this event. We've been working with tourism, and uh, someone from tourism is here somewhere, up the back there, SATC. SATC. Um, you know, we want to still promote safe visitation. Uh, the river is looking magnificent, um, but it's risky, and it presents um, you know, significant risks as well. But we also want people to still be coming to the region, and there's lots of things to do outside of um, being on the river as well. So, um, but it's about being, uh, being safe, and we also um, uh, welcome the Premier's consideration of financial support for tourism operators, and we hope to hear something from the government in the coming days or early next week. 
From a communications perspective, we've also all heard about sa.gov.au as being the source of truth. Um, all of the agencies, including councils, have dedicated websites um, which have up-to-date information and links to the relevant agencies and to that sa.gov.au website. Um, and uh, we've also regularly updated our digital channels. And we're distributing an electronic direct mail on Fridays. Um, we've got a database uh, distribution list for that. If you're not on that, I encourage you to go to our website and um, join up. And we're communicating as much as uh, we can, as quickly as we can, about road closures and, and, and shut-off of swims. Um, we do acknowledge that some of the swims and some of the road closures do have to happen quickly. Um, and we're trying to give that information as much as we can. On the swims, um, some of those decisions are made by SA Power Networks, where they just communicate to us, and you know we, we, we do encourage and we've asked to give this as much time as possible, but in the end, they just have to turn the power off, and if uh, that has to happen, we have to protect the asset and remove switchboards and other structures and that. Um, but we are trying to provide as much information, but as has been mentioned tonight, like now is the time to act, if you haven't already, um, to put your flood plan in place. If you don't have access to... Uh, the internet or websites, um, we, you can come into our offices and our staff will try to assist you as best we can. Um, there's obviously a lot of information and pamphlets here and we can provide and uh, support those. Um, we'll have some copies to give out at our offices. Um, although, we, as I said, we're focusing on preparedness, um, we're also, um, our, through our community team, uh, considering recovery process around those social, built environment and economic impacts as well and we'll continue to consider that. Um, so that's all I've got, and obviously we'll take questions at the end. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge the amazing work that's being done by the SES um, as a lead agency and the collegiate approach of all of the agencies and councils working together. Um, this is obviously really challenging times, um, but we need to make sure we're working together. I'd also like to acknowledge Dave Hassett and all the work that the infrastructure team have uh, been doing, um, and also the support from other local councils. I suppose my end message is that it's a challenging time. We need to be considerate and kind um, and also look out after those people that can't look after themselves. Um, so thank you and I'm happy to take questions at the end. Thanks, Ben. Um, next up, we have Rachel Hunt from the
from one landing to the other. So once the um, estuary reaches a 1.6 metre height, that's when we can shift it. So there will be that period possibly where the Wakery Ferry won't be able to be used. So that will then enact the details for that. The other ferries that may need to close during the event will include Morgan, Lyrup, Madam, Swan Reach, Walker's Flat and Phenom. And as the uh, water flow forecasts increase, there is a possibility that some of the ferries down on the lower lakes may be affected um, by road closures um, as well. So we're still working towards understanding what that means for the people at the lower end of the River Murray. What have I got here? Um, so yeah, so as, as the ferries do um, close, uh, the information will be communicated through the um, various websites and the social media. Uh, so if you do use a ferry regularly for your transport, please keep your eye on that so that you can understand how that's going to affect you um, and what alternate decisions you need to make. So the early closures of the ferries, what we're doing is we're basically putting out um, variable message signage. So that will go out to try each side of the ferry as well as some strategic locations to try and give the general public notice that the ferry is not available to cross the river so that it will try and save some of their travel because we don't want people travelling to the ferry and then having a whole heap of people trying to turn around. So we'll be putting those in place very, very shortly. They will be in place even if they're not turned on. They'll be out there ready to turn on and provide that information to the public. At some times there may be roads that will need to close due to the water levels. Just would like people to understand that the signage might say road closed, but there may not be any water actually across the road. There are reasons for that, so please adhere uh, to the safety element um, of not travelling on that road if it does have a road close sign on it. And then in relation to the marine safety, the marine safety team have asked all users of the Murray River to slow their speed and not to go out if conditions are hazardous. River users need to watch for hazards in the water due to the high flows reminding that some fixtures such as jetties and pontoons will be underwater where you can't see them. When you are on the water, they're asking that you please always wear the appropriate life jacket. And if you do notice any hazards, um, to report them. They're busy out there at the moment uh, with signage and marking the yellow boys to try and keep um, any known hazards identified. So hopefully um, that will keep people safe. So our road maintenance team are currently assessing uh, the roads that will have increased traffic for the detours. Um, we've got increased resources that we will be putting out on the network between now and Christmas to try and alleviate some of the issues um, with the additional traffic. Please don't drive into floodwaters, as I said before. Um, it is a very unsafe practice and we don't want people to put themselves into danger. If you do see any hazards, they can be reported to the Traffic Management Centre on 1800 018 313 and all detours will be posted on social media as well as on the website. If you need any questions, I'll be here after. Happy to help where I can. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Um, next up, oh, Donna, thank you, sorry. Um, next up, we'll invite Barbara Powia, um, who is from the Primary Industries and Regions SA. Um, for those that know, uh, Primary Industries and Regions has um, presence in the region, like uh, my role as Regional Coordinator means that I, I both live and work in region all the time, so I'm driving and seeing exactly what everybody else in the room is seeing. So please, if you 
have any questions um, or need clarification, part of my role is to act as a conduit as well. So um, while SES are leading the response, our role is to make sure that everybody in the room also finds the right person to talk to to solve whatever their question might be. Um, PERSA, along with every other agency in the state, is also uh, doing our mapping and our predictions and we uh, were going well above the anticipated levels uh, a while ago, so we're quite confident that um, at 180 uh, we have minimal um, inundation of primary production land. We do have some annual crops and we do have vegetables and we do have dairy concerns, but uh, we are working with um, industry at this stage and if any of you fall within that um, section and you think that you're uh, growing on a, on a piece of land that will go under, please um, talk to us and, and um, let us know. We are, we're doing a little bit more than just mapping, we're actually going out and also ground truth in areas we don't know. So part of what I've done today is drive around and check places on maps out to see what's there in the ground and what that looks like. So um, we're here to, to try and make sure that our information is able to be responsive as soon as possible. Um, we do know that there are going to, as I said, going to be areas that are inundated and we know that that's going to cause some concern. We're, but we really do want to work through it in a, in a, in a way that, that supports. Um, we, as the agency, also have responsibility for livestock um, and so if there is an issue where there is an inundation, where there is livestock stranded, um, that is our responsibility also to come out. So we will we'll be monitoring livestock where it is um, and uh, looking at where there's registered livestock regularly. So uh, please make sure that everything's updated on the first website and all of uh, that way we know we know what we're looking for. We're also working with RSPCA and the Animal Welfare League for other animal related um, issues. We still have our normal responsibility and I'm just going to go back a step because I will forget this like I did last night. With the rising river levels there are going to be increased snake numbers and so we're going to ask councils to put all snake catcher numbers on their websites or have have them on the uh, accessible through the sa.gov.au site because there are, there is going to be uh, snakes trying to also get to high ground. So just please be aware and from a safety perspective, um, we still have our normal um, uh, responsibilities. We are in a fruit fly uh, outbreak. We have a peer, um, our PFA is currently suspended, so we do actually still have 16 outbreaks in the Riverland, um, and obviously Blanchetown is at the border that we're still trying to manage, but well, we still are managing that. We're going to have exactly the same challenges as everybody else in the room. We're going to have transport issues in getting our workers and our teams on site, and we're going to have access to properties as well. That will continue, and we just ask that everybody has the same uh, patience as, as what's going to be needed. We're actually looking at relocating out some of our teams if needed to uh, be able to be more responsive and reduce that travel time where roads go. We also currently have um, a Varroa Watch and we've got Foot and Mouth and also the Japanese and, and Caphomitis has been mentioned and everybody who lives on the river or works in the river corridor is actually eligible for a free vaccination. So please check the health website or talk to your doctors and your clinics and see when uh, that might be appropriate if you can have one. Um, transport is going to be our single biggest uh, concern initially, especially with roads leaving and uh, going into what could be a record rain harvest. We know that there's going to be a lot of trucks on the road and a lot of movements and a lot of places where trucks would normally travel that they can't, so um, we're, we're monitoring that and looking at what we can do to try and um, support that being as, as low impact as possible. Um, Kimberly mentioned Blackwater. We get into this really interesting space, so the Department of Environment and Water are responsible for water, water management, um, and so the Blackwater event 
uh, if it occurs or when it occurs would be um, reported to everybody via, the, via DW. However, uh, fish kills that are traditionally associated with Blackwater, the cleanup is actually the responsibility of primary industries and regions. There's already been a commitment to do that um, and not leave that to council because they already have enough on their, their plate. So we have got a team of people that are actually already putting in place um, what will happen in the event of a black hawk, in, in the event of needing to do a fish cleanup. So that would be, um, we hope, will be quick and seamless. Um, we also have our farm business mentors, which have been around now for quite a few years. We have three in the River Corridor that are amazing people, Robin Kane, Brent Fletcher and John Chase. They're there for any business people that might want to have a, a chat, find out what's available, where to go for information or just to, just to have a talk because sometimes it's about um, a problem shared is a problem half. So they're there. Their information is also on our website which is obviously also available through the sa.gov.au. And uh, just finally, we, if there is anything, we do have a site at Watson Research Centre and we do work closely with every other agency in the room, so please don't hesitate to give us a call. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Tina Snowden to come up, and Tina is with Housing SA. Hi, everyone. Thanks for letting me into your community today. Um, yeah, my name is Tina Snowden, I'm a Senior Emergency Management Officer um, with Housing SA. Um, we are tasked by the State Emergency Centre to provide a relief response whenever there is an event in South Australia that affects the community. Um, I've been in this role um, and responding um, to emergency events in South Australia for over 15 years, so um, a bit of history there. Um, what is the response that we'll provide? This is a really different scenario that we're facing at the moment. Um, relief normally responds as, as a response when an event happens. So we come in when a fire comes, happens, um, when there's a sudden flash flood, we respond instantly and we provide a response to the community. Um, this is very different where we're actually planning um, and trying to set up um, exactly what the response is going to look like for your community. The sheer scope of the event means that a lot of the services that we would normally provide um, in a relief response may not necessarily be available in your community. So when I say that, um, if we have, a, a, for example, a fire, uh, one of our responses will be to open a relief centre, possibly in this very building. Um, and the second response would be to provide accommodation to people that have been affected or that they've lost their house or the roads are blocked and they can't return home. Um, so in that first instance, we may provide accommodation to the community for up to two weeks. Um, and that would be in caravan parks, it would be in hotels, it would be in whatever accommodation is available. So what we're hampered by with this event is the fact that very little accommodation is available. We are struggling ourselves. We're based in a, my Osiris and I are based in Loxton at the moment and trying to find accommodation um, around that area at the moment is just ridiculous. So we're hampered by those things. What are we doing about that? We're working towards what can we do to assist the community to find their own alternative option, keeping in mind this event is going to go for a long time. You're not going to be able to return necessarily to your home after two weeks. So what are your options within your community, within your family group, within your friends? What plans can you have that will take you through until that water abates? We will have some medium term options available along the Riverland, which we're currently exploring at the moment. But there's not going to be very many and they're not going to be salubrious at all. Um, We'll be looking at using sites that will provide basic accommodation. We're hoping to look for sites where perhaps you can bring your own bed, but that's about it. Um, so yeah, we're looking at all the variety of options that are available. 
Uh, we possibly could use this site as a evacuation centre if it was appropriate and if it was considered safe by the State Emergency Centre. Um, but that would involve stretch beds, that sort of thing. It's not a comfortable environment. So I very much encourage anyone who thinks that their property is going to be inundated and unlivable to really think about what is your long-term plan. What else the government will have to offer once we um, have received approval by our minister? We will have grants on offer, um, financial hardship grants to start with. Uh, they're designed, once again, to tide you over when an event happens for a couple of days. It's, it's not huge amounts of money, um, but it is there and it is available when an event happens. Um, as it progresses um, and as the water abates, and you start looking at um, repairing any damage, there are also government grants available to help you with re-establishment. I think that's about all I've got to offer tonight. It's not very nice, I'm sorry. Um, the government will help out wherever we can. We will um, identify whatever sites we can to provide medium-term housing for those that are most at need and those that can't come up with their own um, arrangements that are much more suitable for a medium term event like this. Um, as I said, we're likely to open a relief centre in a facility such as this, um, and as that progresses, that will turn into recovery centres and we'll have um, all of the agencies relevant um, to the event present at relief centres and recovery centres so that you can get as much information as you can. Um, yeah. As I mentioned earlier, SA Power Networks were unable to have a representative tonight, um, but they've given me some speaking notes, so I'll just whip through those. SA Power is actively monitoring the flood levels at both, by both helicopter and boat to assess the areas um, that need priority attention. As the flood levels rise over the coming weeks, roads and tracks, track clo closures often restrict the, um, the Power Networks access to infrastructure, so that's something to bear in mind. Um, SA Power may also need to undertake bulk supply disconnections, uh, particularly to the shack areas and possibly to other areas um, for the safety of the community and that may already be quite in, in the future. For local businesses, the network will fast track urgent flood related alterations such as raising pump switchboards. Um, these customers need to engage a registered electrical contractor and ask them to raise the alteration request with SA Power Networks. Make sure the electrician includes Murray River Flood in the job comments. They also have a SMS updates and you can register for those updates. There's a brochure over on the table and there's a QR code there so that you can actually log on and get continuous updates in relation to your own property. Some safety advice, if your property is likely to flood, it's best to make it electrically safe before the water actually rises. Switch off the power and unplug electrical appliances and where it's possible, um, raise them above the potential flood levels. Make sure you've got some working torches handy. Um, get a qualified electrician to turn off and isolate your solar panels if they, and if you do have a battery installed with that system, get them to move it to a safer place if that is possible. Turn off your main electrical switch on the switchboard and make sure you keep your mobile phones and other devices fully charged so that you can keep updated and also so that you can report faults. During a flood, just some general safety reminders. Don't remain in the house if it is inundated with flood water when the power is connected. Um, don't use any electrical appliances or a sink or bath. If you feel a shock or tingle, sensation from off any of the metal or plumbing. Just report that problem as soon as possible on 131366. Don't leave your vehicle if power lines have fallen across the car or the vehicle unless you're in immediate danger. Stay inside and call triple zero. Stay well clear of electrical poles, 
substations, fallen power, fallen power lines and any objects that are in contact with them. If electricity poles and wires are covered with flood water, stay at least 150 metres away and also report that incident. And if you're in a boat on flood waters, don't move any power lines that you find and don't travel under power lines. With the rising flood water, it may put you at risk of electrocution. Um, outage maps, you can access flood related um, potential flood related bulk disconnections by using the QR code on the um, handout which is over on the table or log into the SA Power Network website. Um, and as SA Power are not able to answer questions tonight, they are definitely committed to um, providing responses to any questions that you may have that relate to them. So again, if you'd like to put your question onto a yellow sticky note, put it on the SA Power and I'll ensure that that gets to them. Um, next I'd like to invite Josh up. Um, and Josh is with SA Water. Thank you, Di. Um, okay, so uh, to start with, I just wanted to make really clear that um, that there are currently no impacts to any of SA Water's drinking water or wastewater operations. Okay. Now, I'm going to run through uh, three topics, and they are our drinking water services, our wastewater services, and then River Murray structures as well. I'm just going to, when I change topics, I'm going to let you know so that you can flow with me and um, understand uh, where I'm up to. Um, so, first up, uh, talking about drinking water services. Um, I'm going to talk about drinking water quality and then I'm going to talk about drinking water supply. Okay. So in terms of drinking water quality and um, why that's relevant for us at the moment, we've heard and uh, you will have heard and probably are very familiar with them, potentially lived through uh, black water events before. Uh, so that has a potential impact when we think about drinking water quality. Now all of our water treatment plants along the river are designed and equipped with the equipment to deal with uh, black water event and water quality challenges of that nature. Okay. However, depending on the extent of the water quality challenge and how bad it gets, the treatment plants might not actually be able to fully cope and fully process and remove all of the impacts associated with taste and odour. Now, so black water event um, results from the increased organic material in the water and a reduction in the dissolved oxygen. That won't render the drinking water unsafe our treatment plants will still clean and treat that water so that it is safe and clean when it enters the drinking water network. However, if they aren't able to cope, the impact for you and I at home when we turn on the tap is that there might be a potential change in the water's taste or odour. And what that means is uh, we might detect, and it actually just does vary from individual to individual, and it how sensitive you are to these compounds, you might just detect an earthy, musty, uh, slight taste to it or odour. And that would persist uh, while the water quality challenge or the black water event was there. So to reiterate, the treatment plants are capable of dealing with that. They have the equipment and uh, we anticipate that they should be fine. But depending on how severe that event gets, there is a small chance that they might not fully cope with process all of those elements that are and might experience or notice a small taste or odor impact. Now looking at drinking water supply, so that's our ability to actually uh, treat water and push it through the drinking water network to you. So the potential concern that we would have in this place is whether or not one of the water treatment plants would become completely inundated with flood water and therefore rendered inoperable and unable to treat water and push it into the network. Now, the good news is that um, all of the uh, preparation and modelling that we've done, uh, we've used the, all of the information available from our colleagues at DW, and we've always taken the worst case potential scenario to that. Uh, and even looking at the revised forecasts uh, that have become available today, that's still being within the range of what we've been planning for. And at the 
don't anticipate that any of our water treatment plants along the river will be impacted in that way. They're all located above um, those flood markers. Um, specifically, um, uh, so, uh, here in Blanchetown, uh, we are above that on North Terrace. Um, now, thinking slightly further up the river, I've obviously got the Morgan Water Treatment Plant uh, that's above the cliff line, going up my way, well out of that, and likewise at Cadell on River Terrace as well. Um, now, that said, um, that doesn't mean that we're just sitting there uh, doing nothing. So, our teams are actually doing a lot of preparation to make sure that they've got um, all of the uh, treatment chemicals that they might need there, backup pumps, also emergency generation as well, because we could be impacted by uh, the de-energisation from SA power networks or if roads uh, were passable as well. So we're making sure that we've got extra equipment and materials there so that we can continue operating as best possible. Now, in the event that um, a water quality or a water supply challenge actually did eventuate, uh, we will very proactively communicate with you to let you know about that um, through traditional and social media, uh, especially most effective to reach. Uh, so very much tuning into ABC, uh, watching your TV news as well, looking online. Um, look for social channels as well. Um, and in that, we'll very much be letting you know what has happened, but how we will support you and what we're doing in response to that. But also if there are any practical steps that we need you to take in response to help us manage that situation. So that's in relation to drinking water. Now I'm thinking just about our wastewater operations. Um, and again, um, just to start, there are currently no impacts on our wastewater operations um, on any stretch of the river. Um, now, we actually don't operate a lot of the wastewater operations uh, this far north, uh, and certainly not in this area, so I'm not, um, there's not a lot of potential impact that we would see here. Uh, further south, uh, we are particularly looking, uh, we were at that uh, last night, um, looking there at our water treatment plant and making sure that we're putting in some protective measures there, such as uh, raising our existing embankment levees there. Uh, making sure we've got all of the uh, treatment chemicals there, some backup pumps and backup generators as well. Um, again, in the event um, that we've had any kind of interruption to the wastewater network operations, we would do the same thing in very proactively communicating with people through traditional and social media to let them know what's happened, but particularly that is to let them know what we might need them to do in response to help us manage that situation. Uh, so that's wastewater. The last topic that I wanted to touch on is River Murray structures. Uh, so we do operate some of the River Murray structures on behalf of MDBA um, and sometimes at the direction of um, the Environment and Water or DW. Uh, so very briefly, uh, there's changes to the operation of the locks. That's uh, because of the higher water levels and the fact that they're actually really not necessary in operation. In most instances, uh, there are um, clearly marked channels available um, over the weirs for access, um, and the lock staff are still there and available to help um, anyone who's navigating. Probably mainly thinking in the sort of near term. Um, and again, as the event progresses, uh, we probably encourage you to think about whether or not you wanted to or should be on the water at that point. Kind of uh, other areas are the barrages at the lower lakes, uh, and these are managed on behalf of uh, MDBA at the direction of DW, um, and being managed to release essentially what comes in and to match that with what goes out. Um, there's also just a, an interesting point of the barrages is uh, that they actually have what's called a stormway in there, which means that when uh, the water in the lower lakes will get to a certain level, uh, the barrages are set and essentially will um, not really be, uh, they won't have any function because the water will automatically go over the top and go out into the ocean anyway. Uh, and just also to note that dredging at the mouth is currently paused and that's a result of the flow that's going down the river and uh, in keeping the channel open so that activity just isn't warranted at the moment. Uh, now I have uh, a couple of
practical things that I would really love for everyone to do and to think about, uh, and that is um, to be looking at sa.gov.au as your source of information. Uh, the other thing I would really like you to be doing is if you're on social media is to follow the SES so that you can get updates. Also follow SA Water because we will push information there. Um, particularly if you're a Facebook user, that's really great because not only can I uh, push material out there organically, but we can actually use that to uh, pay to advertise so that we can ensure that any critical information reaches you as well. The other thing that I would really love everyone to do is to uh, make sure that your mobile number is registered with SA Water and um, just take two minutes if you can sometime over the next couple of weeks, two weeks or so, call us on 1300 SA Water and you'll get a real person in Adelaide um, and you can make sure that we've got your mobile number on your account so that if we have um, service interruptions or emergency alerts to go out to you, that we can send you SMS notifications as well. It just means that we've got another way to try and make sure that we can get that message directly to you. That's it for me. I'm happy for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Joshua. And that brings um, us to the end of the speakers. So we're going to open up the floor for you to ask questions to all our speakers. And we also have some additional people in the audience that you may like to direct questions to. We have Ryan Meekin from um, SA Police. We have Jenny Turner and I think Bill Namey from South Australian Tourism. Connie Wilson from Destination Riverland. And David Beaton, who's the CEO from the Loxton Wakery Council. Um, and just a few steps. Look, I'd like you to be patient. We only have one microphone. Um, so when you do ask a question, I would ask that you stand up and ask your question clearly. Uh, and please, can you limit it to one question, as uh, there may be quite a few questions that we'd like to get through. We'd like to get through as many as we can. Um, and again, if you don't get your question um, answered, we don't have time for it, please put it over on, on the sheets. Okay, let's go. Samuel, it's this, this microphone we use. Um, if you'd like to wrap, okay. some of the systems uh, like the effluent to the pump station prior to pumping down the, uh, prior to dropping down the uh, uh, pump stations uh, but then I suggest that uh, potentially that putting sandbags over your septic tank just to prevent any leakage.
until a week before those roads are closed and they're opened, then certainly security is going to be one of those concerns. I think that's something that um, SES can take up with SAPOL. Um, unless, Ryan, you've got something you'd like to talk about, but it might be something we can talk with SAPOL directly on offline to see if we can talk about increased patrols or something like that. But I will take your question on notice, and I think we'll try and get... Because um, I think there's thousands of people in the same, going to have the same question, so we'll try and get an answer for you. Okay. Um, any other questions, please? Hang on. Brian. Sorry, Brian, I'm making here. This is the, um, the zone coordinator and acting officer in charge of the Murray LSA. So on the security front, it's certainly super important for people to remain vigilant and report any suspicious behaviour that they do uh, they do notice around town across all areas of the river. So making sure we're all working together to, to stop people doing the wrong thing in our community. So that communication through 131444 to our pleasant to this line is super important. So remember that um, and report anything that you do see. We've got business continuity plans in place where we're placing people, vehicles, equipment at strategic locations across the river. So um, we're available 24-7 to, to be there to support you through this event. So thank you. Michael. Um, this is a question for uh, one, two, and three, SES Council and Police. Um, basically, we've got some buildings to move, um, and it can't happen overnight. We would really like your assistance because we've got buildings that have to move that we have to pay for a police escort to move 1.5 k's. In this situation, that shouldn't happen. Um, one of the things we've built the Great Wall of Blanche Town is for is to keep the water out of our park because in most cases it can take six months to get buildings moved. We've, had, we've slotted it in for next week for four of our buildings. We have to wait till the end of the month for the next buildings. We understand we live in a flood area, um, but when push comes to shove, we should get assistance from the police, council and SES to move buildings one and a half k's up the road, which is going to take us about 15 minutes from the time it leaves the property to the next property. And we have to pay to get that done. Um, one more thing. Um, I'd like to say, say thank you to everyone that did help over the weekend. You've given me a bit more time. Um, It'd be nice if their safe power networks were here because I'm still, we're still trying to work out when our power's getting turned off, like everyone else in Blanche Town, down in the lower area. And yeah, oh, thank you. Just on that, I know that our safe power networks are aiming to give you as much notification as they can if there's going to be bulk outages. But because it's such a dynamic situation, that's going to be difficult. So, um, but certainly SA Power Networks are doing what they can and I've been more than welcome for you to be able to put that onto the question list. Um, I'm not sure, Ryan, whether you'd like to respond yeah. or if there was anything, no. So, if, catch up, that'd be great. Um, any other hands? Um, I think this gentleman, uh, and then you're next. Yeah. Just wait a moment, please. Wait. And I cannot get an estimated level of the lock to work from, whether it's one foot in the, the place or whether it's three foot. Can anyone give me an estimate of what a lock one will get to? Okay, 
Uh, yeah, we do have um, some estimated water levels. So, for instance, um, we think at 160 gigalitres per day, the water level at Lock 1 would be around 6.57 metres. So, for example, today we're at 4.07. So, it's, it's quite a big difference. Um, and I can talk to you about other levels as the flow goes up, and I can catch you afterwards if that, if that would help. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I guess um, a lot of us are down the bottom. It'd be just nice to know, and we know the water goes over the road at the bottom of the hill first, the water's there now. At what stage will the road be shut and will the shack owners get notice? Okay, who am I looking for? <laughs> Um, we've been monitoring all the roads um, and what we've got is a, basically a rolling schedule at present which is a seven days in advance. Uh, we put that on our webpage every Friday. Um, we've had a little bit down there now, it's probably about 600 mil I think from last Tuesday to the edge of the surface. Um, so what we do is we do a bit of a measurement, uh, make an assessment on every road we've got and when the water starts getting closer to the edge of the road then we then <coughs> advertise that on our website. Uh, and that comes out every Friday, so you can be updated through the website. Yeah, we actually email out to all the shack owners, um, and we've also got uh, the list that's been made mention that you can subscribe, and we then send that out to everyone. Yeah. Okay. Coming through. Uh, okay, this one's uh, for the council. Um, when and if. Everything goes under, and um, where the clean-up period starts, e.g., flooring, carpets, chip rock, and all that. What assistance is given one from council, or if any? Is it a, a, a matter of fact, just putting the roadside, and someone comes and picks it up, or are you on your own? Yeah, that's part of our recovery planning, so we're working on that now. Um, and you know, obviously, it's a large um, corridor of the river, um, but we'll be working with the SES and other agencies to make sure that we're supporting um, those impacted residents um, through whether that's opening up our transfer stations or collecting stuff from the roads. Obviously, there's a bit of uh, time to work through that, but yes, we'll be working with um, all the relevant agencies to assist. Any other questions? I put this to the council or the mayor. Um, the internet down here is poor yes. and many times non-existent, if not crashed, for all sorts of reasons. Has anyone approached Telstra to upgrade or put a second line through, even if it goes back to 3G so people can? get off to sa.gov.au. It's great to advertise it, but it's damn useless if you can't bring up the site. Well uh, yeah, look, there's black spot programs and we highlight those issues with um, the government to get some funding. Obviously it's not a cheap exercise, but that's something that we do lobby and advocate throughout the region. And we understand that is a frustration when you can't get access, um, but we, we do what we can. Um, I encourage you to also make um, contact with your local member um, for them to raise that issue through their channels as well. I'll just add to that. Um, I don't know if your phone service is better, hopefully, um, but there is an SES hotline where you can get all information about the high flows, so I encourage you to call that if your internet isn't working. Thank you. Have we got any other questions? Yeah? Would you like to stand up? And you can come up. In regards to the street meetings for those that are, that are going to be affected, we're in a state where there's 30 homes um, just under the bridge, so how are we going to know when that meeting's going to be? Thank you. Um, so here, down here, 
to sell on skin. So um, one of the things that we'll try and do is identify those communities where we can hold the street corner meetings prior to road closures and then what we have done and um, we've done in the past is communicate that. We tend to put them out through um, either at the general store or the pub um, and for shack owner associations to try and um, put like a flyer out to communicate and then we do ask and what we did the last time in Swan Reach is we actually had um, a local, I had a mobile, a mobile phone number for a local entry we then contacted and then word of mouth um, and it, we seemed to get about 100 people or something like that. So we'll try and do it in the most traditional methods as we can um, to try and capture as many people. What I would say though is that I can't promise that every community is going to get a street corner meeting but we will work through and try to do as best we can. Thanks Deb. Maybe over here. A bit of an unrelated question, but uh, primary industry sort of tweaked my interest. Um, I'm curious about if you live here in Blanchetown, which I do, I'm not sure who I'm addressing the question to, and you want to get fruit and vegetables, but there's signs from Wakery saying you can't bring fruit and vegetables into Blanchetown, and there's signs saying you can't bring fruit and vegetables from Wakery. Where do we get our fruit and vegetables? You get our Question. Um, the reality is that, yeah, Blanche Town's in one of those funny little spots which is on the edge of the, um, hey, I live only like half an hour up the road, so I'm in exactly the same situation, okay? Um, there is uh, there is now a change in the receipt rule where if you do buy from Wakery and you do keep your receipt, you can actually bring them back to Blanche Town. Um, if you're going the other way, the Barossa Co-op is actually a registered space as well where you can buy as long as you have your receipt. I, if you come to me later, I'll get your details and I'll give you all the list of the places that you can, but you now can buy and bring back. Thanks, Barbara. Now, do we have any other questions? We are coming to an end. Just a moment. I own the local deli with my daughter and we have not had any information pass through. We don't get internet in the shop. So we would appreciate flyers or a phone call to let us know what's going on so we can tell everybody else that they've got questions coming every day and we have no idea what's going on. So we can't tell anyone anything. So that would be appreciated if you've got a flyer or a phone call to let us know what the hell is going on, because we don't know. And I've got a place down at the bottom too, and that's going to get inundated as well. So, and I don't have time to go down there and do anything. And then we've got to get electricians in to take uh, compressors out and everything like that. Well, f we need time, we need to know when the power is going to be shut up for a start. So we get our air conditioners, our, our hot water services, all that sort of stuff. And I'd appreciate a phone call to the shop or something so I can let people know what's going on because we can't get into that. Thank you. Um, who would like to, is there anyone who would like to take that one on board? Steph, maybe? Uh, thank you. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to um, explain that to us, and I think that's really important that not only SES understands that, but everybody here does. Um, so I really appreciate that and, and what we will endeavour to do and I'm sure that we're going to speak on behalf of everybody that's sitting up here at the moment is that we will try and make sure that we're communicating in the most effective way for you and I am very conscious that people like yourself are like the, your, the local network, you, you are, you, you're fingering everybody, you know. Awesome. Yeah. So, so very much recognise that so we will make sure that we make every effort to keep communicating. Thank you. We've probably got time for one more, otherwise I'll wrap it up. If anyone's got a burning question. Um, look, last question, burning question. Um, with everyone, it's power being shut off and power networks calling up. Is there going to be extra services available, like many more electricians, because we're going to get a couple of hundred people calling at once? I'm not sure if we can answer that. Steph's going to have a go. Oh, you're 
that one crack. Um, do you mean in the recovery phase, so when everything needs to be turned back on, or to be turned off? Okay. Um, I think that's one that we can take offline and raise with SA Power Networks in our zone um, emergency meeting. Um, but I take your point absolutely that the increased demand on electricians is going to absolutely go through the roof. Yes, and coming back on, yeah, so um, the, to touch on what the council has said already with regards to recovery, um, there is also a state focused recovery coordination group um, looking at this, and so we'll try and cover off on all of those issues, including things like the disposal um, of goods and the resupply of things. So. Um, look, I don't, I'm not going to promise anything because I can't, but one thing that we'll also take on board is the, the issue around the internet. And I know that um, there's been a whole lot of work done in the past about what internet coverage there is here. Um, and there is an option potentially of um, uh, some emergency access if needed, but we'll look into that. Um, I'm not sure how it will go, but we'll keep it in front. Thank you. Look, that, I'm going to draw the meeting to a close and I also just want to again thank everybody, our speakers and those additional people in the audience. But most of all, thank you to all the community members that have come out. We really appreciate it. We hope you've got something out of it. Please take some brochures with you as you go. And also, if you wanted to stay around, our speakers are going to stay for a little while as we, as we close up and feel free to come up and ask them any questions you like. Thank you.